Well, good morning, everybody. Um, it seems as though I stand between you and lunch, so um, I'll try and be relatively concise. Um, one of the great things, I think, about my job is that I get the opportunity, not often enough, frankly, to get out and see the kinds of things that are going on, the sort of work which is taking place, which um, is being exhibited at your meeting today. And it gives me a lot of confidence in the future of the NHS, particularly at a time that um, we're going to be entering, I think, into some quite turbulent waters. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. But um, <clears throat> one of the things I'd like you to do is, just because it's before lunch, is to sit back and let your imagination uh, loose for a second. Just um, imagine that you were in a country that had a long history of science. Imagine that it had been responsible for discovering, for example, that the mosquito was the carrier of malaria, for discovering and inventing immunization and vaccination. Smallpox alone is said to have saved more lives and have been lost by all the wars fought by humankind. That was responsible for discovering antibiotics, responsible for working out how to stop and start the heart electively, which is the basis of modern heart surgery, um, that was responsible for discovering um, that, that DNA existed, working out how it was constructed, and that was responsible for working out how to sequence it. Imagine also if you were in that country that had a long history of uh, developing medical technology for example, inventing the clinical thermometer, the intraocular lens, the ECG, the MRI scanner, the CT scanner. And imagine if that country also had four of the top six universities in the world, 15 of the top 100. Imagine if, uh, as a result of some of that, it also had more Nobel Prize winners in medicine and physiology per capita of population by a factor of two than any other country in the world, the United States being the next one. Imagine also if that country had a, a background of innovation. You know, there have been several big uh, revolutions. There's been the Industrial Revolution, there's been the Agricultural Revolution, and of course we're entering, and you will see part of this in the exhibition, the Digital Revolution. But imagine if that if that country also ranked in the Global Innovation Index, the country number three after um, Switzerland and Sweden. And imagine if that country was also producing more maths and science graduates than anywhere else in Western Europe. And imagine also if that country had the biggest semi-integrated healthcare system in the world. And the final bit of imagination that I want you to reach out for is imagine if you could join all of those together. And that's where we get to the role and the nubbins of what the AHSNs are designed to do. Now, we're facing a number of problems in the NHS, some of which are more high profile than others. But in essence, we're caught in a, in a quadruple pincer, if you like, of escalating demand, rising costs, rising expectations, and a very tight fiscal environment. And at the same time, that results in demands for increased productivity from the NHS, where people are working really hard on a day-by-day -day basis, and improvements in quality. And I put it to you that the thing that links those two, quality and productivity, is innovation. And that innovation comes from the minds of people who are working close to, uh, to patients who share their anxieties and expectations on a day-by-day -day basis. I'm quite convinced that no matter what the problems are that the NHS has to face, that we always solve them. And that we solve them because the intellectual capital which resides in the 1.3 million people in the NHS is our strongest and mo most important asset. And frankly, it is often underused. And again, this comes back to the opportunities which exist in the AHSNs. Now, when we were thinking 
about AHSNs, which was during uh, the time of, of Aradazi's review. We went off and, um, and did some work. We looked at where the main patient flows were around our NHS. And we mapped out 15 different areas. And those, broadly speaking, form the boundaries with one or two exceptions of the, um, of the 15 AHSNs. But it is also clear to me that if we're going to maximize the opportunity uh, for innovation and spread, that we need to ensure that within those boundaries, we have the right people talking about the right things. It's also clear to me that as we get into much more complex societal, technological, and medical change, that the ability to solve problems seldom resides within one, um, one group of people or one set of people with particular expertise. It's becoming increasingly complex to solve problems on your own, as it were. So the idea of the AHSNs is to bring the right people around the table who can not only maximize the thoughts, the discovery uh, that comes from the minds of the people that work in the NHS and our academic institutions, but also um, develop those thoughts and also spread them. And that means getting people from academia, people from provider units, commissioners, social services, and in particular, industrial partners around the table to have discussions about how we can move the NHS forward. So it was against all of that sort of thinking that the idea of the AHSNs emerged. So I put it to you that whilst you think, well, the AHSNs are important, please, at no point, underestimate their importance. Because never before in the NHS have we tried to unleash the, the capital and the innovation which exists amongst people who work in it and given them the freedom to do that and tried to create a kind of structural environment in which they can operate. But this is not just about um, doing things for the people who work in the NHS. The end game for us at the moment is clinical outcomes. And <clears throat> I'd like to just explain what I mean by that. So when we went through um, some of, uh, through the last election, when Mr. Lansley was, uh, became Secretary of State for, uh, for Health, he said, I want to make clinical outcomes the currency of the NHS. And um, I was asked to go away and think about this. And one of the great things in my job is that I work with some very smart people, as you do. And um, a couple of days later, um, one of my colleagues, John Stewart, rang up and he said, he said, I think I've got it, um, which was a relief, actually. He said, there are five things that any healthcare system should do. The first is it should prevent you dying early um, from things that a healthcare system can prevent. Now, what, bear in mind that the major determinants of early mortality in any society are number one, your level of education, and number two, tobacco usage. But clearly, the health service can have a significant impact once you've developed certain conditions. The second thing it should do is it should look after you well if you have a long-term condition. The third thing it should do is look after you well and effectively if you have um, or need a short episode of care from the health service, whether that be an episode of flu or a broken leg or a cataract operation. The next thing that it should do is it should look after you decently. And one of the things I put to you that we haven't been really good at in the NHS is customer service. You know, so many people feel that they should just be grateful for what they're about to receive, while we focus on the other things without focusing really on customer service, patient-centeredness in a way that other industries have to think about it. And then the fifth area 
that, um, that any healthcare system should do is it should look after you safely. And you'll have heard from Mike Durkin during the course of the day. Um, but I'm quite clear in my own mind what I mean about safety. I think patients accept the risk of their disease. They accept that that disease, uh, that the treatment of the disease carries some risk. They make a value judgment on whether they want the treatment or not. What they should never have to accept is that the way that we deliver our services, the way we organize them, will add to that risk and impact on it in a negative way. So, the way that we improve clinical outcomes is not through directives from the Department of Health or directives from NHS England. It's by freeing up the innovation and creativity of the people who work in the NHS on a day-by-day -day basis. And the aim of the academic health science networks is to use innovation to reach into um, different parts of our, our industry and healthcare and social care systems to bring that innovation to life and to help to spread it. So I think I'm going to stop there. I think there'll be a number of other things that will come out in questions. But let me be quite clear. I see a very promising future for academic health science networks. They will all bring different things to the table. And what is really important is that those academic health science networks foster collaboration within their networks and collaboration between the networks, and that we use that for the spread of innovation across our NHS for the benefit of, of all of our patients. Thanks very much.